Well, as we said, let's just pray as Dick comes to preach to us. Children of God, by grace alone, how we thank you, our Father, for your grace, your mercy, your great kindness to us, that you have penetrated the darkness of our lives, of our world, of our own hearts, opened our eyes, and flooded our lives with the light of your life. How we praise you for the riches that we have been enabled to see all by your grace alone. And we thank you, Lord, that as we've feasted on your word in these days together, enjoyed the time of having our eyes opened afresh, and we trust our hearts warmed again by your words of life to us. We thank you that once again we have seen the boundless wonders that are ours in Christ. And we pray now that as one last time we come to this word of life, you would once again speak to us and then send us on our way rejoicing and with great purpose and clarity and vision and energy as your servants. So hear us and help us, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. To Timothy, please, tonight, and chapter 3 and verse 10. To the um, relief of my many friends, I don't blog, neither do I tweet. I'm never quite sure the difference between the two or how you do it. But if I were to try a blog tonight, I think I'd say something like this, that at a conference like this, you get glimpses of truth um, that are so great, so transcendent, so serious, so wonderful, um, that you are bound to say to yourself, who is sufficient to explain that, to preach that, to make that known? It's a, very, it's a very healthy feeling in a way. If, um, if we are real teachers of the Word of God, I think we'll never have a swollen head. And if you have preachers who have swollen heads, they can't be teaching the Word of God properly because, of course, that brings us straight into the presence of God himself. So I, you will find that, and especially I want to say to younger ones, don't be too depressed. You'll give up your best, and then at the end you'll say to yourself, well, what a mess I made of that, and how much better. It's sometimes very disheartening to be a preacher because you realize how great the truth was and how inadequate your presentation, and of course that will be true again. Now, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. You who, are, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me, and so on. Eight or nine mys you have followed, uh, you know all about. I think after Paul died, uh, if people wanted to know about the great apostle and what sort of a man he was and what he did, it would be good to be able to turn to Timothy because he knew the lot. Uh, not as a scholar, not uh, because he'd been taught it, because he'd been involved in all of it from the beginning, or from the beginning of his life. And I sometimes think, what a, what a remarkable experience if scholars today, scholars of the New Testament, were able to have an interview with Timothy for two hours. What astonishing preconceptions would be removed, wouldn't they? What changes in emphasis we should hear from that. Things we couldn't imagine coming from somebody who'd actually been there. Well, now, for this final session, I thought we'd have a final word. I've chosen Paul's final word in his letter, his second letter to Timothy. Uh, all I'm going to attempt is a fresh introduction, no more than that. Uh, it's an incomparable treasure. I have treasured this letter all my ministry. I'm sure this is true of every preacher of the Word of God. But you see new, new marvels in the treasure as you go on, and I want to show you some new marvels that have come to me. 
I've been doing a little rethinking on this letter. You can become a little stale and feel you know it all, and perhaps I didn't. So I want to give you three questions that demand an answer. Here's the first. How come this widespread seeming apostasy that Paul reports so agonizingly in this letter. Chapter 1, verse 15, you are aware that everyone in Asia has turned away from it. All, everyone. Uh, chapter 4, verse 16, at my defense, no one came to my help. Everyone, no one. I mean, this is very strong language, isn't it? Uh, is it hysterical? Is it uh, an exaggeration? Uh, is it really true that there are only a few faithful friends left here named at the end of the letter? Has there been suddenly a widespread abandonment of the church and of the Christian faith in the province of Asia and elsewhere? I think if you were to talk to somebody of the day, they'd have said, no, no, certainly not. We've not abandoned the faith at all. We've got the, quite the wrong impression. What we've abandoned is Paul's claim to be an apostle. His shameful imprisonment was the very last straw. It's obvious that God has abandoned him, and so must we. I think you can begin to see the point if you realize that from the medieval church onwards, when a man had done great work and become a leader of the church, he finished up not in a prison, but in a palace. I think there's a sense of shame in the Church of England still that we call them palaces, though actually what happens is that in these large buildings, people live, bishops live in a drafty flat somewhere on the third floor if the church commissioners can't sell the wretched building in any case. But it's a big, big difference, isn't it, that the church has put its leaders in palaces, whereas God put them in prisons. Well, the reason isn't very hard to find. We have the most remarkable revelation of the false teaching. Uh, normally, as you know, the false teaching in the New Testament is only given us by hints and uh, single uh, phrases, which we can apply to many today. But here in chapter 2, verse 18, it's very, very clear, isn't it? And I'd ask you to turn to that, if you will. People who swerve from the truth saying that the resurrection has already happened. Now, that is a remarkable statement, isn't it? There's a sweeping movement in the province of Asia, in Ephesus, and we know also that it was probably happening in Rome as well, uh, Philippians chapter 1. Uh, the pundits, as you know, call it over-realized eschatology, and it refers to something that has been in the Church of God from the very beginning. Millions are attacked by it, or rather attracted to it. Uh, the prosperity gospel rages in Africa and many parts of Asia today. The holy perfectionist gospel has troubled the church frequently. I can remember as a student going to a conference of the Overcomer Movement, and there was a very godly lady missionary with the, uh, the regulation bun and very plain clothes and no makeup, you know, a really great old saint. And I can remember standing in front of the fireplace and telling us that she had not sinned for six months. <laughs> and uh, from the talks that we had at that conference, I went back to my chums at Cambridge. I was over the moon about it because at the age of 19, 20, 21, 22, you have many moral temptations. And I said, I found the secret. But they soon disillusioned me. And then there's the healing, what chaos that produces when things don't come to pass as apparently they've been promised. And then the idea that you would worship with the language of angels and all the rest of it. It's widely acknowledged by the commentators, is it not, that in the heresies that are going around at the time and that Paul is talking about, there's a Jewish element and also an incipient Gnostic element. And it's this incipient Gnostic element that produces an over-realized eschatology. I came across a description of this, not from a Christian, which fascinated me, and I wrote it down. I'd like to give it to you, a man called Eric Vergler. Uh, he's talking uh, not primarily about Christians, though he brings that in. Quote, 
This is the primary heresy against which the church has battled from the start. Notice it's not liberalism. Liberalism in that sense is not a heresy, it is simply unbelief. Quote again, a tendency to import the transcendent directly into the real, that is real life here and now. For that's what was going on. Quote, to demand that final end of the world be present now. Now, I think this explains a great deal of the language in 2 Timothy. There's a great deal from Paul of apologia. He refers frequently his chains and the pain that it is to him to be in prison. 2 Timothy is as much about the apostle as his son in the faith. The appeal of the letter is, join me in suffering. It's got a double meaning, isn't it? Join me in Rome, but also join me in the gospel of a suffering servant that requires suffering servants today. Don't desert me. Stand by my side, as the Lord himself has. Just a note here, the sharp-eyed and the sharp-eared will realize, of course, that those who abandoned Paul and his apostleship were, though they didn't realize it, abandoning the apostolic faith, so that they were, in fact, leaving Christianity, though they had no idea of that at all. That's the first question. So question two. How come that many gifted and wise commentators, evangelical ones I'm thinking of, see in Timothy a man quite unready for this great responsibility, requiring a great deal of bolstering all the time, and of course the familiar picture of timid Timothy. There may be something in that. He may have had a weak tummy, I don't know. He may have had nervous problems, I guess many people do. But you know that familiar picture of a timid and nervous neophyte. Yet all those commentators, and I've looked at as many as I can find, have all agreed that the CV of Timothy is extraordinarily impressive. Let me just jot down a few things of the CV. Fifteen years accompanying the Apostle Paul. Joining with Paul in his missionary journeys, many of which were dangerous, both physically and in other ways. The apostolic delegate to Corinth, Thessalonica, and Philippi. And I guess I wouldn't, be want, I wouldn't want to be sent to Corinth to sort, sort things out, would you? A co-author, I don't know quite what that means to you, but his name is associated with Paul in the authorship of five or six of the great New Testament letters. He's the chosen and appointed leader of a key church in the province of Asia. When Paul writes to the Philippians, he says, I have no one like him. So of all the assistance that he'd had, he says there's no one like him at all. I was reminded, I don't know how it came to my mind, of the naval flimsy. I did my service in the Navy. I was the lowest form of animal life in the Navy, which is a midshipman. And after a year, you get what's called a flimsy. And it usually puts in a sentence what the man senior to you thinks of you. Now, the truth after my first year, my flimsy ought to have read, useless, no one so incompetent has been in the ship for all. What I would like on my flimsy was, there is no one like him that we have seen in, uh, in this rank before. And then I begin to think to myself, I'm going to be an admiral one day. <laughs> so here is a youngish man, about 35-ish, when we meet him in 2 Timothy. He's coming to Rome to take on the great apostle's legacy. Incidentally, I find that quite interesting. I've talked to quite a number of people in uh, quite big jobs, and it often happens that God prepares us for many years before he puts us in the slot that he wants us to do our main work. Many of my friends tell me that they began their ministry in uh, the ministry which they gave their life to at the age of about 35, 36, 37. 
I came to St. Helens after 14 years of preparation. I had 14 years in youth work under a very rigorous uh, regime, and then I had 10 years in ordained ministry, and five of those years gave me an opportunity of going all around the country, tasting every kind of opportunity. So I didn't go to St. Helens until I was 36 years old. That's just about the age that Timothy was going to Rome to become responsible for the great man's legacy. And yet, John Stott, I would call him a master expositor. His little God, the Gospel, I regard a gem of a commentary. I can't quote exactly because I don't have the book here, but he says something, and you can find it for yourself, that Timothy was hopelessly unready for these responsibilities, hopelessly un inadequate. And yet he's just printed out the CV. How can he say that after 15 years? Well, I think I know the answer. I'll offer it to you now off the record. I think I know the answer. John Stott was an exceptionally gifted man and an exceptionally humble man. He became rector of all cells, and I think it was at the age of 49 or 50. Evangelicalism in the Church of England had been in decline for 50 years. From the time that he became rector of all souls, for the next 50 years, there was steady growth. There were great leaders like Lloyd-Jones and John himself. He must have known that we who were coming up behind him looked to him as our leader, that he was the only leader possible for Anglican evangelicals, and he must have said to himself, I'm just not sufficient for this. I don't have the experience. I don't know how I'm going to handle the future that lies before us. I'm sure he felt that. I think this is just a spot of autobiography in his commentary. He saw the young Timothy and he saw himself. But he got it wrong. Timothy had had 15 years and was a battled, hardened campaigner. Third question. If then Timothy was the most privileged of all Paul's assistants and probably the most gifted, certainly the most battle-hardened, have I said, how then can Paul address him in 2 Timothy as though he is a beginner, a neophyte, uh, needing a reminder of the basics? I have never found an answer in any of the commentaries to that question. The only one who faces up to that question is C.K. Barrett, Who's, and he's very reverent in his attitude towards the pastorals, Barrett says this is proof positive that 2 Timothy is fictitious. <laughs> because the apostle could not possibly have written to someone who had accompanied him for 15 years in these sort of terms. It seemed, and seemed to me when I came across it, to be unanswerable. I think there's only one way out. And that is to suggest to you that we have never learned to read 2 Timothy adequately. I'm wanting you to put then on an entirely new pair of spectacles. And first to tell you what is very obvious, that 2 Timothy, like 1 Timothy, is an open letter. Just look at the end of 2 Timothy, and you'll see it says, Grace be with you. In the other versions, grace be with you all. All is not in the Greek. It is grace be with you. Look at the bottom in your little thing. I can't read because my eyes are not good enough, but I think you'll find a note saying the Greek says it's plural. These are open letters, or they're analogous to an open letter today. Let me give you an illustration of what an open letter means. It does not mean an individual Glaswegian writing to Gary Hughes and asking if Gary Hughes would give an explanation as to why he called the Rangers fans the great unwashed. As you know, it's been in the paper for the last two days. I don't know how Gary Hughes' secretary would deal with that letter. I imagine they'd put it in the waste paper basket. Or he might possibly write a short note back saying, thank you for what you said. Uh, uh, I really am not anything to say to you. 
But now suppose that this last region, a man of no importance, not only wrote a letter to Mr. Hughes, but sent a copy of the letter to the Scottish Football Association and a copy to the Glasgow Herald and the Times, Telegraph, etc. And that's exactly what has happened. And that's why in your paper yesterday and today, Gary Hughes is in a very embarrassing position because he called the Rangers fans the great unwashed. There's all the difference in the world between a private letter and one that has to be read by the public, and 2 Timothy is the latter. Paul is writing to an important church at Ephesus in the central province of Asia. You can't have a more important church, really, in those days. He's had all the same troubles at Rome. There's a desire for a different model of leadership in accordance with the, the powerful teaching that is going around that the Christian life has left the cross and suffering behind, and now we're all living a heavenly life in the power of the resurrection. There's a sweeping movement of this. It's tremendously attractive, and many are beginning to follow it. And therefore, the leaders of Ephesus and elsewhere are saying, we want a leadership of this kind. We want to fit in with this great new movement that is giving life and hope to the churches. What then does he do? One, he writes a brief letter, thankfully. Secondly, he traces his partnership with Timothy from Timothy's conversion uh, and, in a sense, an ordination. Thirdly, he identifies Timothy with himself and himself with Timothy. And then he identifies at least three big issues in which they stand united and which the leadership of the churches must conform after he has been beheaded or martyred uh, in a few weeks' time. Now, I'm going to go straight on to these three big issues because that's what really matters. This is only an introduction. But before we do that, I want you to get, I'll give you an example of how he writes this letter so that you might put on a new pair of spectacles. Look at the thanksgiving in chapter 1, 3 to 7. Now, in a sense, this is quite an unimportant, uh, less important part of the letter, but it's very, very revealing. Remember, there were Jewish elements in the Christianity which were spoiling things. So, I thank God whom I serve as did my ancestors with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers. In other words, what I am preaching is a proper development of the Old Covenant. What I stand for as a Christian apostle, I stand with a clear conscience in the sight of my father Abraham. Verse 5, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. Exactly the same thing. In other words, Timothy, you have nothing to be ashamed of in your new faith in Jesus Christ, though many will criticize you. It is in full line with your mother and your grandmother who are Jewishes, Jewesses. Your Christian faith is a proper development from the Old Covenant. Now, that is very typical of the right. He keeps writing in this letter, putting himself and Timothy alongside and showing that Timothy is a proper follower of apostolic Christianity and there is no other way in which the church can be led. Uh, you get the same at the end, where you get this very moving, I have fought a good fight, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith, and then, of course, the whole S emphasis at that end is, Timothy, you are to fight the good fight, you are to finish the race, you are to keep the faith to the end. Now let's look at the three big issues. You're so familiar, I hardly need to do, draw, to do more than draw attention to them. First, Timothy shares with Paul the same spirit, chapter 1. How easily we misread this. It is not singular, it is plural. 
For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us, not just you, God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control, which I prefer to be sound mind. Therefore, because the Spirit of God who is in me as an apostle was given to you in the laying on of my hands, because we share <coughs> in the same Spirit of God, what are we committed to? We are committed to the gospel of Christ crucified, and we're committed to the fact that we who follow him and serve him will suffer as he did. Therefore, do not be ashamed, or rather I prefer to knock out the A, do not be shamed by the testimony of our Lord, of me, his prisoner, but take your share as a minister of the gospel in the power of God. Now, my brothers, this is an us thing. It's to do with the apostle as well as Timothy, Timothy and the apostle. And what he's saying is that the Spirit of God, which is the mark of his apostolate, is upon Timothy, and the mark of the Holy Spirit governing a ministry is to be centered upon Christ crucified and the pattern of ministry that follows from it, which we'll come to in a moment. You and I probably, especially if you've had a fairly long ministry, and I'm talking here for a moment to the more senior men who are here, will have heard many claims for the Holy Spirit, many claims of movements in the Holy Spirit, many claims of what the Holy Spirit gives to those who take him seriously, whereas the hoi polloi don't really know about this power. And I think I'm very doubtful whether they would have taught you that the supreme mark of the Holy Spirit is to point to Christ crucified and the ministry of taking up the cross. Have you heard that as a special movement of the Holy Spirit? To Paul, that's normal Christianity. Timothy then shares with Paul the same spirit, the spirit of God. Secondly, chapter 2, Timothy shares with Paul the same truth. We begin at chapter 1, verse 12. I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow this pattern of sound words, of healthy words, that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within you, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. So the first sign of the Holy Spirit dictating and governing a ministry is to center it on Christ crucified. We go on now to find that the Holy Spirit is supremely concerned with the deposit, the truth, entrusted once of all to the apostle and then by him to his followers. Chapter 2. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, notice heard from me, entrust to reliable men who will be able to teach others also. Reliable is very important there. Faithful is a poor translation, I think, because faithful has become a cliche, hasn't it? Oh, he's a very faithful man. The question is, is he reliable? When you give him the truth, will he pass that on, or will he have changed a lot of it, or added, or subtracted? Here is the truth that God has given to the apostle, and if Timothy is to take care of his legacy, he's got to receive that truth by the power of the Holy Spirit and see it, it goes to reliable men for the future. Isn't that what Servants of the Word is all about? If you're not a reliable person, please leave this room, because you're not wanted here. There's no point in people coming here if they're not going to be reliable, passing on what they have been taught. This is not a matter of fireworks. It's a matter of passing on the basics that you have learned from others that have come down from the apostle. First then, Paul shares with Timothy openly in front of the churches, in front of the elders at Ephesus, in front of the leaders in Rome, where there's a great influence of Jewish Christianity as there has been ever since. Roman Catholicism is marked by Jewish elements, which it's never been able to get rid of. Thirdly, Timothy 
shares with Paul the same pattern of ministry. Chapter 3, verse 10. You, however, have followed my teaching. Now, it's very important to understand what this means. It does not just mean that he's trotted along behind and put in his notebook certain things that Paul says and certain things that Paul does. No, no, follow means you've been part of the whole deal. You've experienced these things, and you have followed them in doing them yourself. You have followed the pattern by carrying out your ministry in speech and deed as I do. Well, what sort of pattern do you think you'll find on the pastoral epistles? All of you know, and I should thought every minister in this room has preached on the three, picture, the pre the three analogies in chapter 2. Just turn back to chapter 2. They're so familiar, I hardly dare to, uh, to, 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 to notice them again. Verse 3 of chapter 2. Here he talks about the enemy. Finally, of course, the enemy is Satan. And our suffering there is the scars and wounds as we enter the warfare with the enemy. To be a soldier inevitably means wounds. You've been called up to a war, and it's a war that goes on all your lifetime. That's rather different, isn't it, this new heresy? We're living in the light of the resurrection, and we've left all that kind of thing behind. With the athlete, the enemy is not uh, without. The enemy is within. This is my self-indulgence. This is the inability to take sin, sloth, and all these things within me seriously. This is the temptation to be out of, tra out of training, out of, out of spiritual fitness, if you like. Well, if you don't want to be an athlete, if you're not willing, apparently it was 10 months in those days you had to train. I know nothing about that otherwise. But if you're not willing to be in training, if you're going to not attend to your health, and those sins that so easily beset us, well then, you'd better leave the track, because you'll never win the prize. With the farmer, it's not the enemy, of course, of the devil outside, fighting all the time. Uh, I've just been told that in Sydney, if you witness outside in the streets, you'll be arrested. I suppose that will follow here fairly quickly. There's the enemy openly firing his shots through a feeble government that's waving the white flag. A soldier, an athlete, Where's the enemy for the farmer? Well, you know very well where it is. If there's going to be a harvest, it's hard won. There will be many to there will be toil and many tears. We did Psalm 126, which was well done in our group just now. If you want to look at that, look at it later. Toil and tears if a harvest is to come. Now, my dear friends, I mean, you know this as well as I do. But you can't fit those analogies, those pictures, with 2.18, can you? If the resurrection has already happened, if I'm now rejoicing in a heavenly experience, what have I got to do with soldiering, or athletic training, or the hard business of getting up early in the morning to do my farming, to milk the cows, and all the rest of it, says I, who know nothing about farming or whatever. Powerful forces are at work in the churches of Asia Minor and indeed in Italy, wanting a different kind of leadership. They know that the great apostle is on his way out. There's pressure being put upon the new generation, pressure to conform to a slightly easier way of conducting your ministry. And no one is immune from this pressure. I've actually witnessed it. I suppose in a long life you're bound to do it, and I have to tell you it's very ugly. Perhaps, yes, I have to confess, in the Church of England we're more open to it than some other churches, because we have bishops, and people long to be bishops, I suppose. I don't know why, but they do. I won't go into it now, but I have seen things like this, very promising young men being uh, 
taken under the wing of senior churchmen in the Church of England, and although I didn't hear it and I wasn't present, I can tell you for certain how the conversation went. Bill, you would be very helpful, you know, in the future. Uh, we have been watching your life and your ministry and have been very impressed by it. If you wouldn't have so many of these slightly hard edges, you know, if you just widen a little bit, not quite so narrow, you could be very useful in the future. You're just the kind of man the church is wanting today. Very ugly, isn't it? I've actually seen it ruin a man's ministry, a man of immense promise. When you look at the text, you have to ask yourself, does this fit this picture of Paul and Timothy and the transition, this very important transition between the apostolic age and our age when there are no apostles? Is the leadership going to be in tune with the apostles or is it not? That's the key to, to Timothy. So let's finish by looking at chapter 4, verse 5. I love these four imperatives, and I want to ask you, and I want to ask myself, do these imperatives fit with the picture that I'm giving you of this little letter? We've had the moving testimony about the end of his, or rather we're just about to have it, but before that we have summarizing all that he has said, four vital commands. And the first is a great anticlimax. Be sober. Oh dear. So, my dear young men who've been in my group, some and girls too, how promising you are. Uh, I've got great advice to give you in this last session. Uh, young people who want to exercise ministry in the future, learn to be sober. Excited? <laughs> Thrilled? Well, of course, the translators have done their best to open that out to us, haven't they? That's what the words actually mean. The ESV is very safe, be sober-minded. The, uh, uh, the NIV is better, I think, keep your head. What he's actually saying is that this headed teaching is, that is going around is intoxicating. People are drunk with this new spirit. And they tell you that's the way ahead. But a sound mind is indispensable to leadership. I wish that translation was there more often because it comes from the same family of Greek words. It's usually translated self-discipline, but amongst that is the sound mind. So all that is going on in these churches, it's a crisis time. The devil is active. He's wanting to divide people. He's wanting to, uh, he's wanting to introduce now a different kind of gospel to the one, the apostle. The apostle is going, what a chance for the devil to conform people more to what he wants. And Timothy too, if he can. It's probably a very good thing if you're complimented on something and you're in Christian work to forget it as soon as possible. Never keep a list of the compliments that are made about you. But sometimes you may remember a sentence that was spoken to you that does give you courage and a sense of satisfaction that something you did was of considerable benefit to a number of people. One of the senior men at St. Helens, I remember, I have no idea who it was, after one of these times of trial and people losing their head in every direction, he said to me only four words. He said, Dick, you kept us safe. You kept us safe. Now, I think that's exaggerated. There are plenty of other people in the church, of course, ministering. I can't take the full credit for that. But I've always been glad at those words. You kept us safe. The second letter to Timothy is all about that. Paul is writing to Timothy Timothy knows everything that he's saying to say in the letter. He knows it already well, inside and out. It's not new, but it's an open letter explaining what Timothy has done in the last 15 years and therefore what he's going to do in the future and what the future is going to be after the apostle has gone. 
And it's as though Paul is saying, Timothy, we'll keep you safe. That's the point of the letter. May that be true of your ministry too. Secondly, endure hardness. That's better than the word suffering because they've had that great deal. But hardness, I think, gets right to the point of it. It is hard. Chapter 2, verse 10 is very striking, isn't it? Because it links the hardness with God's electing work. Where is it in chapter 2? Am I right about that? Thank you so much. I'm getting increasingly blind. Yes, that's right. Thank you. Verse 10. Wake up if you haven't got that. Therefore, I endure everything. And my word, what he was enduring in that damp, dark dungeon. I endure everything, all this criticism, all this betrayal, all this failure in the church at Ephesus and Rome. I endure all this hardship for the sake of the elect, that they may obtain the salvation that is in Christ with eternal glory. Yes, that's beyond our understanding, isn't it? But that's the way God works. He works through ministers who are enduring hardness. And if we go the easy way, there'll be very little evidence of God calling people to himself. Let's be kind to Demas and people like that. I'm glad that some of the modern commentators don't dismiss Demas absolutely. I think when Demas went off to Thessalonica, he wasn't deserting the faith. I'm not sure he thought he was deserting Paul. He just wanted an easier place to work. And he knew there would be no so tough battle in Thessalonica as there was in Rome. Three. And this really is the major charge of the letter, isn't it? Chapter 4, 1 to 8 or 9. Do the work of an evangelist. So important. Is it really you could say that's the complete message because everybody's getting uh, sidetracked by this new wind of false teaching, which is carrying people away. That seems to offer an easy discipleship, a heavenly experience, which is, of course, not available. And so the great charge is not to let evangelism slip down the, the list, so to speak, the agenda. But I always think you've got to attach chapter 4 to the beginning of chapter 3. You are to evangelize in this circumstances, times of great difficulty. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, without self-control, treacherous. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That's the situation, Timothy, and the church. He's not only talking to Timothy, he's talking to the church. That's where you ought to evangelize in the real world. Actually, it's quite striking, isn't it? He's to evangelize in the tough world, but he's not to give up those people who have been betrayed and in this new teaching. I think it's rather touching, actually, um, that in chapter 2, some people read it, don't they? What are the verses there? They read it as they were told to get out of churches where there's any false teaching. I don't think he means that at all. So in verses 23, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know they breed nothing. So, yeah, you're not to be contaminated by that. Avoid all that. But the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness so they come back to their senses. Notice, they come back to their senses. People have lost their minds. They're mad. And that's a very high standard, isn't it, for us, in, or rather you, because I'm on the way out like the Apostle Paul. My days are numbered. But you go into a world where evangelism is the number one priority, but not forgetting the people being carried away, that if they will listen, you can bring them back to their, their senses. And then the last of all, nearly always rather feebly translated, I think, in verse 5, fulfill your ministry. What does that mean? Discharge all the duties of your ministry, the old translation. 
Uh, the comparison is Acts 12, 25. When Paul and Barnabas had finished their mission, they returned. He's talking here about finishing, finishing the race. Finish what God has put your hand to. Well, we can only exhort you to do that because the God who is yours and is one who's able to keep you to the end. But it's quite a frightening thought for some of you who are in my group, isn't it? You're so young. And the Bible is telling you that you've got a long race ahead and you've got to get to the end. And what does Paul say? Well, it was the way the Father has gone, that is, himself and my son must follow me in the same way. To Timothy, perhaps has a special word, as I finish, to future leaders amongst us. Perhaps to those of you who happen to be specially gifted and have what others will begin to recognize as leadership qualities. As I understand it, it must be so, in the days to come, such leadership is going to be very, very badly needed. We can't do without leaders. Pressure to fit a looser and easier standard is going to be all around you. It was so in the first century. It will be in the 21st century. So I want you to remember at this time the spirit you have received, the truth you have received, and the ministry pattern you have received. And if you will take these as seriously, as Paul laid down, not just for Timothy, but for the churches of his day, then, chapter 4, verse 8, henceforth there is laid up for you the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to you on that day, not only to the apostle and Timothy, but to all who have loved his appearing. Well, let's pray. Thank you that the scriptures are written for our learning. Thank you that Paul urged this upon Timothy and urges it upon us today. May we rightly divide the word of truth and live according to the standards there laid down and do this through your mercy and grace. And we ask it through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.